Good morning. Jesus is coming. He's really, really coming. Interesting, Father Joe said that if we're not ready for his coming today, then we have no reason to believe that we're going to be ready tomorrow. And Advent is a time of preparation for that coming. Whether or not we're ready has a, has, has a lot really kind of, um, is, is very important. There's a lot riding on it. It's a lot at stake. Right, so we see in today's second reading from St. Peter, our first pope, talking about the delay of the Lord of the Lord's coming. And he talks about how one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. And this is his way of saying, like, don't, don't think that he's delaying in the same sense that we might think. Because the issue of the day, the people were wondering why the Lord hadn't come back yet. But he says something very important. He says, the, Lord's, the Lord is patient with you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The implication is, is that one of the reasons why God has not yet come is because he wants everyone to repent. That the patience of the Lord is directed toward our salvation. And the other implication is, is that if we do not repent, we might perish. So repentance is necessary. So that when we die, it's the state of our soul that is most important. Do we die in a state of union with God, or do we die in a state of, of rebellion against him? And he continues. He says, he, he describes what the coming of, of the Son of Man will be like, the coming of Jesus. He says, the heavens will pass away with a mighty roar, the elements will be dissolved by fire. The, and he talks about the heavens being dissolved by fire and the elements kind of melting in fire. It's a pretty stark image. It kind of reminds me of Father Joe's cooking. <laughs> just all this flame just coming up, right? But this is a very, very stark image. And, but notice what he says. He's telling the Christians that this is going to happen. But then he says, since everything is to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be conducting yourselves in holiness and in devotion, preparing for the coming of that day of God, conducting ourselves with holiness and devotion. Our primary task as Christians as we prepare for the coming of the Lord is to conduct ourselves trying to live lives of holiness and to be devoted to God. That's our number one task. And he says it in a different way toward the end of the reading. He says, therefore, beloved, since you await all of these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him. To be eager to be found without sin. That's our task. And that task cannot be possible without prayer. Without personal prayer, we have no way of living lives of holiness, no way of living lives of, of devotion, and we certainly are unable to avoid sin. So I want to share with you two points about personal prayer that I believe will help us live lives of holiness and devotion. Number one, give yourself space to engage with the Lord with what goes on in your heart. Give yourself space with the Lord to engage with him about what's going on in your heart. One of the primary ways that we engage with God is that we, we lift up to him our thoughts, our feelings, and desires, all the stuff that's going on in our heart. And we lift that up to him, and then we ask him to speak into that. We ask him to be present to that and, and to give us his truth and his love and his goodness in the midst of everything that's going on. It's heart speaking to heart. That's what this prayer of the heart is really all about, so, which is really essential to Christian prayer. But this can be incredibly difficult to do, especially if we're not really aware of what's going on interiorly. If I'm not aware of what's going on in my heart or in my life or my mind, then it's very difficult for me to be able to present that to the Lord so that I can have deep personal prayer. And there's a reason why that is more difficult today. Part of the reason is that we live in a culture that is very, very busy, that makes it seem very difficult for us to be able to be present to God, to be recollected, and to be silent. We often succumb to the tyranny of the urgent. We tend to busy our lives from morning until evening with so many things that we don't have time to sit with the Lord and to be able to engage our hearts with him. And one of the things that happened when I was in formation as a, as a seminarian that made this kind of drive, drive this home for me is a priest was talking about all the different ways in which we avoid God. 
all the ways in which we avoid intimacy with him, avoid that type of prayer in which we really give to him all of our stuff and receive from him. And he asked this question that I'm going to ask to you. He says, where do you go in your pain? When you're feeling hopeless, when you're feeling lonely, maybe when you feel rejected, or you feel like you're, you're a failure, or you're afraid of something, where do you go in your pain? And he says, some people go to sense pleasure. You know, they get, they get home at night and they find themselves thinking about all these things and they, they just start eating. They go to the refrigerator, they go to the, the cupboard. Other people, they go to drink. They've had an anxious day at work or maybe anxious day in life or maybe they just start drinking because they're in pain. They have all these things going on, but they, they go to those things in their pain. And some go to sexual pleasure. Some in impurity go to pornography or whatever that is. Now, and certainly each of these things can be enjoyed when they're properly ordered toward love. He says that other people tend to, tend to busy themselves with their hobbies and work. These are the type of people who can hardly sit still. There's so much going on that they don't even, aren't even aware of. They busy themselves with all sorts of activities and, and tasks in such a way that they're not engaging what's going on inside of them. And there's other set of people that often will, will go to media or TV. They just veg out in front of the TV, just trying to keep their minds off of what's going on. Or they spend their time in social media or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or YouTube videos. Where do you go in your pain? And when he said this, what it, what it really kind of impressed upon me is that there are a lot of ways in which we do not want to give God our heart. We do not want to give to him what's going on. And, and those things are the enemy of prayer. What's fascinating to me is that the results are always the same. When we avoid God on the level of our heart, our thoughts, our feelings, and emotions, we are also avoiding him being his, his, who he is in our life. We're avoiding him speaking into our problems and our difficulties and our lack of peace and our anxiety and our fear and our hopelessness. And that will always leave us unsatisfied. The fact of the matter is, is that we can't have it both ways. We can't live on the surface of life, numbing the different things that are going on in our hearts and act and expect to have the deep satisfaction and peace that God offers to us. We can't have it both ways. We can't, we can't be these people who just say, you know what, all that stuff about prayer and interior life, that stuff doesn't matter. And then expect to have the deep, lasting love and peace that only God can give. And he gives that in prayer. You see, the truth is, is that this is one of the reasons why I talk so much about inner healing. Why I talk about confronting the brokenness and the weakness that each of us have in our own way. Because if we're unwilling to confront that ourselves, we're not going to allow God to confront it in us. And we're going to keep running away, going to these things that will never satisfy us. This is why the paradox is that the more that we avoid what's going on inside of us, the more that we secure ourselves or lock ourselves into the very thing we're seeking to avoid. And that's that interior pain, that difficulty. I think as Christians, we know there are certain things that are lies that we know we're not supposed to believe. But when we don't pray, we will end up believing them at some point and at some level of our heart. We will give in to lies that we know are not true. Such that the lie is, well, if I was only better at this, if I was only more successful, then I would have peace. Then I would have my, my, my joy. Then I, would, I, then I wouldn't have anxiety. If I only had these type of people like me, if I only had favor in this sector of society, then I would be at peace. Or maybe if I only had more comfort, if I had this possession, right, if I had more luxury, more pleasure, then I would be at peace. Then I would really, really be, I, I will really have arrived. Or maybe if this thing doesn't happen in our culture, if this thing doesn't happen in our society with regard to politics or, or anything, then I will be able to be at peace. You see, the fact is, is that there are a lot of people in our world who have everything that they want and they're not at peace because peace does not come through the world. It does not come from us being satisfied with what we want. It comes through a relationship with God who is peace himself, who is love himself. You see, we cannot have it both ways. 
And if we're not praying these things that we know are false, we're going to think and we're going to believe that they're true. And we're not going to be able to grow. So the first part is give yourself space to engage with the Lord with what's going on in your heart. Number two, expect God to bring his presence and his truth when you lift your heart up to him. Expect that. You see, the battle of prayer primarily is a battle of expectation and faith. What do I really expect to happen when I present my heart in its raw and naked form to the Lord? What do I really expect to happen? What do I believe is going to happen? Let's just say that I have a low-level kind of sadness or maybe hopelessness that I carry with me most of my life. And I really don't believe that God can do anything about it. And I don't believe he wants to do anything about it. Well, as a result, I'm not going to go to prayer and to be honestly lifting that up to him because I don't believe it's going to do anything. My belief determines my action. But let's say I have these, these experiences of hopelessness and sadness that are happening in my day, and I believe that I have a father who loves me, who not only can come in and break in and bring me his truth and his presence, but he wants to. And I open up my heart to him, and he speaks into that. He's present to me there, and he loves me there, and he gives me his truth, which, which takes away the darkness or the heaviness of that hopelessness that I've been carrying. That's how simple it is. Lord, this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm desiring. This is what I'm afraid of. What do you say to me? What is your truth? How are you loving me in this? Just be with me in this sorrow and this difficulty. Just those acts of faith can be radically transforming for us if we expect God to be there with us. One of the things that's very important is that, and I'm going to specifically challenge men here, is that I think as men, most of us spend a lot of our mental energy avoiding our weaknesses. We avoid our weaknesses being seen by others, especially women. We don't want to acknowledge our weaknesses, so we spend a lot of energy trying to avoid them, and when we see them, we tend to despise our weaknesses because we think it's not manly to have weaknesses. We want to be the best at this. We want to be seen as being good enough. Well, the problem is, is that if we're unwilling to acknowledge that in ourselves, we're never going to know the love of our Father who wants to be our strength in our weaknesses. And that's what God wants for us. He wants us to be strong in him, not strong in ourselves. And this is something that we can experience in prayer over and over again. We can come to God in our weakness. We don't, we don't need to be ashamed of it. We don't need to run away from it because God is our strength. If we're weak, he's strong. If we're poor, he's rich. If we have darkness in our heart, he's our light. What's interesting is that a few years ago when I first came to the parish... I was really struggling with a lot of insecurity. And as oftentimes in prayer, all my insecurities come up, right? And that's what happened when you pray. Your insecurities will come up. And I was thinking about, okay, how am I doing with the parish? How am I doing with, with, uh, with the staff? Like, how am I doing? What about this going on in the parish? And, and I found myself thinking to myself in my prayer. Has anyone else had that experience? But you're sitting down to pray and you just find yourself thinking. And I realized I wasn't even praying. I wasn't talking to God at all. I was talking to myself. So I just, I, I brought myself to the Lord and I said, Lord, this is what's going on in my heart. Look at my insecurities here, here, and here. Just radically open to God and honest. And immediately I heard him say this, your insecurities are not your responsibility. All I want you to do is give them to me. I'll take care of all of this. Just be yourself and have fun. That radically freed me from the burden of having to be a perfect priest or a perfect pastor or a perfect mentor or whatever. Like, I was free from that because I didn't have to try to do it myself. See, I was trying so hard to be good enough. And I think the same thing can happen for us if we're honest with ourselves and we open that up to God and we realize we don't have to be afraid of that. And so the truth is, is that all we need to do is to lift up to Jesus what's going on in our hearts and expect him to be present to it and expect him to love us in all of that. And one final point. We need to stop pretending that we don't have time for prayer. We just need to stop pretending. With the exception of stay-at-home moms and dads 
who need to make sure they work with their spouse to, to make space for their own personal time for prayer, I don't think that really applies for most of us. In fact, if you look at the statistics, it's apparently the latest statistics is that the average American watches four hours of TV, the average adult American, four hours of TV a day. And that's not counting other, other parts of social media. Four hours of TV. A more honest assessment would be, Father, prayer is hard. Father, prayer is what I have to face all of my demons, all of the thoughts that, I, that are very painful, all the diff- difficulties in my life. It's where I have to think about all the stuff going on that's outside of my control. And I would say, that's honest, because it's true. But that's precisely where God wants to meet you. The second thing could, that could be said is, I don't know how to pray. I was never taught how to pray well. And that's very honest. A lot of people haven't. We're so blessed to have generous benefactors who have given us this book called I Heard God Laugh by Matthew Kelly. We're giving it away at entrance B over here. We, I ask you to pick one up and read it. It shows you how to establish a daily prayer life, which is critically important. But one thing is for certain is that Jesus is coming back and he wants us to be ready. And he wants us, first of all, to be ready through prayer so that we can live lives of holiness and devotion. And I I can guarantee you, if you take seriously Jesus is coming to you in prayer, then you will be ready when he comes again.